Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press webinar. My name is Cecilia Cancelero, and I'm the senior editor for U.S. and Latin American history in the New York office of Cambridge. I'm delighted to be here today with Professor Michael Gomez to talk about the second edition of his tremendously important book, Reversing Sale. Before we start, I'll just go over the format of today's talk. After my brief intro, Professor Gomez will talk for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I will ask him some questions, and we invite you to do the same. Um, for you to ask questions, I will um, draw your attention to the chat box uh, on the right, the comments box on the right side of your screen. You can use that box throughout the webinar to submit questions um, or to contact staff if you experience any technical issues. So anytime during the talk, um, sooner rather than later, in fact, you can submit your questions there and I will then see those questions and um, ask those questions to Mike um, during the time that I'm asking him my questions. So it's my honor to introduce to you Professor Michael A. Gomez. He is currently Silver Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University. Mike was the founding director of the Association for the Study of Worldwide African Diaspora, and he served in that role for seven years, beginning, I think, in 2000. Mike is also the author of many books uh, and the editor of many books as well, so I will not name them all here. But I will mention Exchanging Our Country Marks, The Transformation of African Identities in the Colonial and Antebellum South, Black Crescent, African Muslims in the Americas, and African Dominion, A New History of Empire in Early and Medieval West Africa. And that book won the 2020 Martin A. Klein Prize from the American Historical Association. Mike is also the series editor here at Cambridge of the Cambridge Studies on the African Diaspora book series. And of course, the author of the book he's here to talk to us about today, Reversing Sale, A History of the African Diaspora, which is actually part of the series I just mentioned. So Reversing Sale was originally published in 2015. I mean, sorry, 20, 2005. Um, and it has become a foundational work in the field. Um, it's an expansive yet accessible history of people of African descent who found themselves living outside of the continent or in parts of Africa that were territorially distant from their lands of birth. The first edition of this book became just a staple in classrooms um, and an extremely influential work in its field. The second edition, which we published in 2019, will no doubt continue to be a force, especially because it has been revised and expanded in some very important ways. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Mike Gomez. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for your introduction, and uh, I want to welcome all of the attendees uh, to the session <clears throat> on reversing sale. And so I want to talk about just a bit about, you know, the conceptual framework for uh, reversing sale. <clears throat> and uh, the book is written on uh, twin premises. One, uh, is that we have to we have to um, we have to initiate a discussion of experiences, the history of African people um, in some uh, in some other place temporally uh, than than slavery. That is to say that. In particular, in the United States, uh, as a child growing up in this country, uh, being uh, educated in public school, at least at the elementary school level, uh, my sense of who I was, my sense of of black people, uh, was uh, communicated to me uh, formally. That is to say, within the school system, uh, by way of um, an introduction into slavery. So, so for a long time, that's how I thought. Uh, that's I thought that's where black people came from. We were, you know, we were always slaves, and then, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, um, the situation unfolded from there. So, so one premise of reversing sale is that that conversation, that story, needs to to, to begin someplace else, uh, because actually. 
uh, to begin a discussion about people in slavery is very damaging. The second premise is that you is that the history of African descended people uh, cannot be best told within the confines or within the constraints of the nation state. Uh, that is to say that I mean there's a place for um, the history of conjoined communities as well as specific publics within the framework of the nation state. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but there are experiences, there are circumstances, there are issues and themes that, um, that really become amplified and become much more clear uh, when they are placed in the conversation with experiences of similar kinds of communities outside of, of territorially bounded uh, configurations. And so th those two premises inform the work and so the book actually begins in antiquity, and we begin with a conversation of, um, of uh, Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia, the Greco-Roman period. Uh, it extends into a discussion of um, the roles and appearance of Africans in uh, the Hebrew Old Testament and 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 sorry Hebrew Old Testament and 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 Christian New Testament, and then it moves into a conversation about about Africans and their descendants in the Muslim world, which of course is a, a tremendous expanse. And then uh, after having had that conversation, it's at that point that we begin to take on the question of the transatlantic slave trade in conjunction with Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and um, and um, and trans-Saharan trades. And so that we recontextualize our understanding of the Black experience. And that is to say that, indeed, it's not a romanticizing of, of Black history. It's not a romanticization of African history, but it simply says, you know, let's look at you know, an anterior series of experiences which better anticipate and better present uh, what takes place beginning in the 15th century, at least insofar as, insofar as the Americas are concerned. And so the, um, the logic of the book is that it's, it's, it's really a kind of, um, it's really a conversation about a scattering and then a gathering. Uh, and it's really interesting because uh, uh, the logic of the book is that as a consequence of, of a series of often global events, the different communities that comprise what we're calling the African diaspora begin to understand, re, 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 begin to connect with each other, and and begin to kind of uh, come together in a way, okay, that uh, is actually in many instances facilitated by various facets of imperialism, colonialism, post-colonialism, and so forth, by those very same uh, structures, people in diaspora find each other, connect with each other, and begin to understand the ways in which their experiences both converge and diverge. And so then the question becomes, okay, so what do people make of those experiences? And and how do you know what what conclusions do they do they uh, arrive at as a consequence of of comparing their experience? That is, for example, what conclusions do people from the Caribbean uh, arrive at in thinking about their experiences, their regional experience relative to North America or relative to South America? or Europe. And so the interesting thing about it is that invariably um, 
some sort of conclusion the conclusion is various it's it's variable but part of the the argument is that is that it's a question or a series of questions that have to be addressed it's not something that can be ignored and in all of that of course is is the is 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 africa and and you know, County Cullen uh, asked this very famous question, what is Africa to me? And, and it seems to me that by and large, African descended individuals and communities uh, have to answer that question. And for some, you know, the answer is, uh, doesn't mean very much to me. And for others, uh, it is that it actually means a great deal. And even as we speak, even as we speak, we have once again this kind of global phenomenon taking place, which is uh, arguably, you know, knitting together uh, these disparate communities. And I'm speaking now of uh, the current moment of unrest we find ourselves in, in which we see the Black Lives Matter movement um, <clears throat> unfolding. Uh, on multiple continents, and and it's interesting that it, it, the ways in which uh, persons who are speaking different languages, participating in different cultures, and so forth and so on, you know, uh, uh, um, identify with each other, and um, and uh, and pursue uh, this notion of African diaspora. And so, reversing sale is 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 was written for the purpose of introducing students at the undergraduate level to uh, the conjoined experiences of African descendant people and about which there's so much ignorance. And um, so that's that's what I'm trying to do there. So, um Mike, what inspired you to write the book? I know that it was published in 2005, but um, I believe that you had the idea for it much earlier, like in the mid 1990s, when I think you were teaching at Spelman. Yes. Um, and also, I believe it was a really interesting time in the academy when things were changing with certain fields. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think it has to do, um... Uh, the motivation for writing the book probably goes back without getting too uh, too much into the into the into the uh, into the minutiae. Uh, but I think that the inspiration or the motivation for the book actually extends back to my to my to my childhood and trying to understand who I was uh, as the son of uh, an Afro Puerto Rican father and an African American mother. And being raised in the United States, you know, what what does that mean? And um, and confronting uh, in the school system an absolute dearth of information about, uh, I mean, absolutely very few clues as to try as to how I might, you know, navigate uh, through those questions. And so I was always aware that that young people needed tools in order to try to understand their their circumstances um, and and so that so you had that and so then i trained for the doctorate in african history and so i i, I had a professional interest in, in specifically west africa and uh, uh, undertook research there but I've always had this interest in the question of well, what is the relationship to, you know, what is the relationship between Africa and and these African descendant people uh, scattered here and there. So, so I've had a personal interest in all of this, but also a professional interest in trying to see what's happened, what was happening, and and it was a moment. You're absolutely right. Uh, in the in the in the in the academy in which uh, you were beginning to see the development of, of scholarship that addressed these kinds of questions 
And uh, in, in particular, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of discussion about culture and, and, and the ways in which, you know, uh, there were overlaps and, and, and continuities and, and so forth. And so there was a moment in the, in, the, in the academy, in the scholarship, in which I felt that I could, you know, make a contribution and connect, you know, my interests uh in you know in these multiple in these multiple worlds and i should say as well that um in senegal i was very much uh so that's where i uh, did my initial research uh and in senegal i came under the tutelage if you will of uh the eminent uh professor buba kavari who um was also very much interested i mean he writes histories of, of, of Senegambia and West Africa, but he's always had a, an interest in diasporic matters. And that greatly inspired me that this eminent uh, West African scholar uh, shared uh, uh, my, my curiosities about the linkages. Um, and, and when you wrote it, when you wrote the book, I mean, were you thinking that it was something that um, I mean, at the time in 2005, and, and when you were thinking about writing it, were there were there many classes that people were teaching at the time that were sort of sort of intro to the sort of African diaspora, or were there very few? And was that something that you felt like the book would sort of serve a need and also create the opportunity for people to teach more classes because the book existed? Yes, no, it's a, that's an excellent question, and, you, and you're bringing me back to a part of the original question. And uh, so thank you for that. No, um, at the time I was teaching at Spelman College, which is an undergraduate institution for African-American women. And uh, I taught at Spelman College for nine years. And uh, when I first came there, uh, we taught something called World Civilization, uh, which was a two semester course. And uh, it was com complemented that the, the history course, the history department taught that course. It was complemented by uh, world literatures taught by the English department and so forth. And so uh, it became very, so I, you know, wondered about that. That is to say, here we are at a historically black college. And uh, once again, you know, this is at the, this is at toward the end of the 20th century, you know, once again, I am confronting this this this, this problem of an, uh, of a, of the relative absence of of the study of African descended people, you know, right you know at, right here at historically black college in the United States, and so um, so certainly so certainly so one of the things that we did structurally was to kind of reconfigure. Um, the curriculum at Spelman, and we came up with a course uh, entitled Af The African Diaspora and the World. And so what we did was we took world civilization and we recentered it around the African experience. And so uh, that was quite, a, quite an undertaking, but what it lacked was a text that could accompany it. And so, uh, so all of those impetuses, you know, my youth, my my research interests, and the practical need for for a tool that would facilitate uh, this kind of study came together, and uh, reversing sale was the was the result. Um, I, I love that story for so many reasons, um, and you know, as an editor, you know, one of the things I say to people all the time is. Um, you know, know know who you're writing for, know why you're writing a book, and it will work if if you think of those things. And this is a perfect yeah. example of that. I mean, there yeah. was a need, and um, you responded to that need, um, and and here we are. You know, how many years later? Um, yes. Second edition that is is uh, that is like I said, it's it's not just that it's successful because um, you know you filled a need that was already there, but you also allowed people to. Um, to, to create classes and, and around the book because the book existed and that's that's my favorite kind of publishing. Um, so if I may say one other word about that, Cecilia, and that is I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that. Okay, so uh, 
that was the uh, that was the that was the context within which the book uh, I began to write the book, but I but I actually wrote the book uh, uh, while I was at New York University. I I you know taken a position at New York University, and so the book was written uh, in conversation with um, a number of graduate students both in African diaspora and in the history of Africa. And so um, uh, that was a very interesting process in which I was able to, through, uh, you know, through the classroom and, and through consultations and so forth, I was able to bounce a number of ideas off of, uh, off of these graduates, these wonderful graduate students, all uh, the most of whom have, uh, have of course gone on and they're in the academy and, and producing works of their own. So I, I needed to I needed to say that. Yes. Um, so <laughs> tell us a little bit about um, what you changed uh, between the first and the second edition, which I think also will probably give us some clues about how the the study of this field has changed. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I did was to sharpen the thesis. That is to say that uh, there are these kind of watershed moments throughout. The history of diaspora, African diaspora, that really um, uh, bring that experience together, and so that I, so I definitely sharpened the the thesis, but also, of course, there was a need to to um, bring the book up to date with respect to uh, all of the new data and all of the new studies uh, that had come in since its publication. In 2005, and I and and you know as well as I that the study of the African diaspora has just has just got it has just taken off, uh, and uh, I mean at one point, you know in the 1990s it was a kind of um, it was seen as a kind of fad, if you will, but in the academy. But now it has a, you know it it is it is firmly entrenched within the academy, and it is uh, and and it is influencing other other forms of uh, endeavor in particular it has it has um, raised the importance of transnational study and transnational approach so yeah um you know with respect for example to the the the, the data surrounding the transatlantic red sea indian ocean slave trade all of that needed to be updated I also needed to come, I need to take into consideration some of the argumentation that uh, had developed since uh, the, the end of the 20th century, in particular, uh, the need to uh, uh, better incorporate uh, intersectionality into the approach and uh, also Certain sections had to be rewritten. For example, the discussion of um, the African in the Muslim world had to be extended. And so I had to also include a discussion of Africans uh, in what becomes Turkey and Pakistan and, and uh, you know, into these areas that ha I had uh, didn't have the information for uh, before for the first edition. And then also, there was a need to take a look at Renaissance Europe um, and to locate, uh, um, you know, a kind of modicum, uh, a, a small African presence in Renaissance Europe. But it was very, very generative in that uh, it, it uh, set up an opportunity to try to examine what happens after the 15th century. Uh, to the perspective of, of Africans and how that changes and how the transatlantic slave trade uh, is a moment in which uh, attitudes and opinions and beliefs uh, about black people and you have a kind of rise of, of race uh, as, a, as a critical, uh, as a critical, uh, Part of the are part of the calculus uh, for understanding uh, the human condition, how that all emerges, and so I had to kind of 
reconsider or to or put in uh, a section on Renaissance Europe and Blacks or Africans in Renaissance Europe, which sets that up very nicely. I think the other thing that the book does, the second edition does, is that it extends the conversation into the beginning of the 21st century. And there, what I do is I take a look at um, how developments in the African continent reverberated uh, onto the African diaspora and helped to um, constitute that diaspora. In particular, I'm looking at the uh, the, the struggle of, of Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Angola against the Portuguese, and I'm looking at the anti-apartheid movement uh, in South Africa, and how those struggles uh, were monitored, but in the in the diaspora, but not only monitored, but also there was there was um, actual participa participation on the part of diasporic actors in those theaters of war. And then finally, the book ends up with a conversation about post-World War II migration uh, from, from Africa into, into North America, into Europe, from the Caribbean into Europe, uh, and so forth. And so I take a look at this whole question of, of, of African global migration and the impact that it is having uh, on uh, the formation of the African diaspora. So what that raises is the question of, you know, what is the relationship between, you know, this kind of post-World War II, much more recent dispersal of Africans to this earlier formation? And I try to address that. So we have some questions from audience members that I would like to get to now. Um, uh, it's great. We have a freshman who is taking an intro class at Howard that has a question for us. Um, and she asks, why was the antiquity section mainly focused on North Africa? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. And there I had, there I made a, a choice. Uh, it was a very deliberate choice. First of all, um, uh, you know, uh, Saludos to 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 Howard University and uh, is very much in the news for for obvious reasons uh, with respect to the vice presidential candidate and so I wish her and Howard all the best. Um, yeah, the 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 kind of standard approach to anterior histories of Africa have tended to be dominated by you know, kind of anthropological work and inquiry and uh, attending to small scale societies and, um, you know, either the absence of or uh, a kind of uh, minimal representation of governance and that type of thing. What I wanted to do very, in, with, with all intentionality was the rate to raise the question of looking at uh, those parts of of the ancient world which were renowned, in particular uh, societies along the Nile Valley. And I wanted to raise the question: What is the relationship of those of those of those societies to the African experience? And you know, how do we how do we how do we understand that 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 empires and states which are clearly on the African continent have uh, heretofore been excised from the history of those con of, of that continent? How are we to understand that? And so uh, I want to take that on, and I want to argue that these are a part of Africa, these are African societies, these are African empire states and so forth and so on. And I think that's very, very critical, okay, to, un to, 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 to subsequently addressing this whole question of post uh, 15th century developments uh, for both Africa and the African diaspora, because after 1500, you know, to quote uh, Chinua Achebe, things fall apart in a big way. So, um, so it's important to begin the conversation 
uh, with a consideration of Africans in very different molds, very, very different molds, uh, as imperialists, uh, as, uh, as uh, people who were at the head of cultural achievement as people who participated in cultures and societies which were celebrated and so forth. It gives a very different orientation uh, to the African experience. But I extend the conversation into early and medieval West Africa, where once again, we talk about uh, these uh, very large constructs, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and so forth. So that gives us a very, very different orientation uh, about the African experience. And I think that's very important. I think that we, you know, it's very easy, you know, uh, to talk about hunters and gatherers and, and so forth and so on and give this false impression that this is the, you know, this is the origin, this is the genesis of the African experience. That's part, those, those experiences were there and that's true, but there were other experiences as well, which I, which I wanted to bring to the fore uh, and, and make an argument about. Um, and also, the other thing too is you have the historicity of that, but then you have the ongoing significance of that because these ancient civilizations along the Nile, Egypt, Nubia, subsequently uh, further south in Ethiopia, continue to reverberate and continue to inform, you know contemporary understandings of who uh, various uh, parts of the African diaspora imagine themselves to be. These are very important stories. These are very important uh, concepts that continue to live, okay? And so it's important to take a look at those things. Okay, we have another attendee question that asks, would you agree that one of the most important points of the African diaspora is the misconception of the true establishment of black people before slavery? Yes, and I've tried to, this is the thing that I've tried to, you know, address uh, in my earlier comments uh, and so forth. What this is what I'm, this is what I'm endeavoring to do. So what I want to establish is an accurate history uh, as I mentioned before, I, I'm not interested in romanticism. I'm not interested in trying to um, uh, repair um, uh, uh, the collective ego, ego or to inflate uh, that ego in any way. But I, my, my view is that an accurate, um, you know, and obviously as a historian, and as all historians uh, in this forum understand, uh, there is no, you know, uh, um, unassailable position on any, you know, uh, interpretation of history. Uh, all of it is subject to, uh, to, to debate, and and historians have uh, have uh, famously uh, debated uh, any and all aspects of the past. So with that understood, with that understood. What I am trying to do is to uh, is to is to recover as accurately as I can uh, an antecedent past, uh, and I think in so doing, it very much uh, debilitates. It very much enfeebles this notion that you know Africa has no past, that it begins in slavery, and so forth and so on. So I, I very much concur with the premise of the question. Um, so it's another question from someone who has taught the book for years, it says, and um, asks, on the years I have taught the text, history students in my class have always struggled with the chapter on Africa and the Bible, especially with the use of the Bible as a historical source. Any reflections on this? I don't, yeah, that's a very good question. And I, and I don't present, so this is the thing. Uh, and maybe I'm not doing a good job of, 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 of explaining why, uh, in the book of explaining why I am, I am referencing this. I am not attempting to use the Bible as a historical text. What I'm trying to do, I mean, that's, 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 
uh, obviously something that each individual will have to determine as to whether or not, uh, you know, the relationship between the Bible and history. What I am, what I am arguing, however, is that uh, sacred, sacred texts very much inform subsequent, subsequent formations in the diaspora. And, and if you look at um, diaspora communities, they are either, they're somewhere between some, some sort of embrace of monotheistic religion and, and ancestral African religion. And, and uh, you know, it works out variously depending upon the, upon the, the, the community in question. But those texts are very important. And so the issue is not whether, you know, the issue is not, uh, you know, whether the flood took place or, or whether Noah uh, or Nu had three sons and this, that, that's not the issue. The issue is the implication of those stories for diaspora communities. And, and it is the case that a number of, of Black constituencies, if you will, uh, see in, in, in sacred scripture either some sort of prescription for their circumstances uh, or uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, prophecy uh, that, that, that relates directly to their experience. Some even see themselves in the sacred text so, so these these texts are very very important. Um, so I would say that your students absolutely should struggle with uh, with the question of the Bible as a historical text. That's not my point. I okay. hope that helps. Sure. Yeah. So this is a big question, Mike, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you anyway. Um, how do you think the lack of education surrounding African American history in elementary education should be amended? Yeah, so what has to happen is that's an important question. It's a critical question. And so what usually what happens is that you have, you know, the monographical material very specific kinds of advanced studies that look at specific issues, moments in time, people, themes. And then uh, as that literature proceeds, the scholars who write these composite works, world history, global history, as well as texts that are confined to the, you know, to the nation state, US history, French history, et cetera, and so forth, they take that information from the, from the advances made in the monographical material and then uh, bring them together in a synthesis in these textbooks. At least that's the way it happens for um, European history uh, and, and arguably even Asian history. Uh, the problem that we have is that the African continues to be left out of uh, these these textbooks, um, and that is to say, text that textbooks that purport to teach world history, or or you know, uh, global history or some such thing. Uh, there is also a subset of that big history which attempts to connect the history of human beings to uh, <laughs> to the universe, uh, and so. This is a big problem. This is a major, this is a big problem. And this is something that I address in uh, uh, this book that came out a couple of years ago, African, African Dominion, in which I am trying to insert, I'm trying to raise the question of how early in medieval West Africa uh, connect to global history. And I'm making the case that in fact, uh, early and, and medieval West Africa should be centered in that history. Too often these, these texts begin the conversation about Africa actually uh, with colonialism. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just um, unacceptable. 
All right. So what happens then is that if that if that's the trend of the of the world history, global history, uh, um, uh, scholar uh, of the, the trend that that we see in these texts, then the people who are writing textbooks for secondary school and elementary school often uh, are simply going to follow follow that lead. So we have to have interventions at all at, at, at every level. And we need to um, devise texts. We need to devise texts that can be used at the secondary level as well as the primary as well as the elementary school level. This history of Africa and the African diaspora needs to be properly taught from the beginning. As someone who grew up in the United States and who was um, severely damaged by a, a historical approach to the Black experience, okay, um, I, it, it, it pains me to think about the millions of children Black children, yes, but also all children who are similarly disadvantaged by this misinformation. And it's form it's formative. It's formative. And it's very, very difficult to dislodge at the level of the of at the level of, of the university. I can't tell you. I teach courses on Africa. I teach courses on the African diaspora. I could have a course a whole year on African history or African diasporic history with undergraduates. And at the end of it, at the end of it, uh, too many of them refuse, refuse to seriously consider that their image of Africans, that their, that their, that their, that their perspective on, on African descendant communities, societies uh, is wrong. And 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 so this is something that they have obviously, you know, you know, they've been socialized through the media, through television, you know, movies, the music, so forth and so on. And so they have a certain concept of black people of Africans, which tends to be atavistic. It's very, very difficult to 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 overcome that, but it needs to be it needs to be uh, you know addressed. And um, um, you know that's a that's a difficult thing uh, that involves politics, involves state institutions, the legislatures, uh, the federal government. Uh, you know, but it you know it definitely needs to be done. And and so it'll require resources. I mean, it really requires resources that that have not yet been identified resources that will allow i mean we have scholars i'm sure in the in this in this forum that allow scholars to take off a year or two or three and to actually write these textbooks yeah and uh and and then you know so you would have the materials necessary to mount the campaign to the, to then incorporate those kinds of textbooks into the curricula at uh, secondary uh, and uh, elementary school levels. Okay, I think um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, could you address the the idea or possibility of a reverse diaspora? Well, uh, I think that um, in some ways, I think in some ways that has been a process that has been ongoing since these various slave trades through the Sahara Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic. That is to say that, that for those who have, who have, who have considered the question that County Cullen puts, uh, put before us, what is Africa to me, and have determined that, well, it means something to me. Not quite sure what it is, but they've answered the question variously. But all, of, but and so obviously some will reject the notion that Africa has anything to do with them. People of Af who are descended, or African descended, 
will reject the notion that Africa has anything to do with their current uh, circumstances. But I think since those trades, there have been those who have answered the question differently and said, well, there is some relationship. And so whether it has been a kind of psychological return or uh, um, an interest in, you know, some sort of cultural um, connection, you know, the, the, um, African descended people have been kind of returning, have been kind of reversing, and that's the that's the thesis. I mean, that's the the subtext of reversing sale. That is to say, that people have been returning uh, in many ways over the centuries. They may not necessarily they may not necessarily be a physical return. Yeah, uh, although that has taken place, but people have been affecting different forms of return. Uh, and it's a complicated question because it raises the question of what are you returning to and, and what is your, your concept of Africa? And of course, Africa was not in some sort of stasis, you know, since the, since the, since the 15th century, the continent itself has been, uh, undergoing, uh, enormous change. Yeah. But I think that what we see is uh, I think that what we see is uh, any number of efforts to understand uh, the relationship between uh, between Africa and the diaspora. And I think that the consequence is that there have been a number of movements, most of which have been cultural, but also political. Yeah, also political. Um, and affecting these kinds of alliances and, and connectivities. Arguably, the, the, the cultural workers have been out front on this uh, and have been so for a long time. You know, the musicians and the plastic artists and, and, and novelists and so forth have been way, way, way ahead of historians in particular on this question of the ways in which these connectivities can work. And, uh, and so we see this uh, in many, many different forms, arguably the most obvious one being Afrobeat, which uh, is just this wonderful, wonderful infusion of all of these different influences. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, there, it's not so much a matter of people kind of returning to Africa as as it is the the what we're seeing is a kind of flowering flower flowering of a global africa um great thank you so um so i think we we will end there and um so let me just say thank you for spending this time with us thank you for um, not only writing this book, but for making um, a place and a space for this work and the study of this field in the academy, um, and also for um, you know supporting students and scholars, and for you know I'm lucky enough to work with you on a book series where we get to support other people's work in this field, and um, we have a tremendous amount of exciting work coming out in that series all the time. So we can see how this field is just burgeoning and, and flourishing with incredible work. Um, and, um, you know, you're partly responsible for that, for the work you've done as a sort of the foundational work you've done in this area. So thank you for all of that and for being here and answering our questions. Um, thank you for every, everyone for joining us today. Um, and just a reminder uh, to say that everyone who is, is here or who has registered will get an email with a recording of this webinar. Um, and you will also be able to um, order the book um, using a discount code, a 20% discount code, which will be shared in that email. And if you are an instructor and you are considering using this book in your class, you can request a free examination copy from um, www.cambridge.org backslash reversing sale, one word. So um, thanks again um, for joining us at this Cambridge University Press webinar, and um, we hope to see you again sometime soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.